Hey everyone, this is Nick and this is your Linux open source and privacy news for the end of October 2021. Strap yourselves in because it's a long one, including a first version of Photoshop on the web, Linux beating Windows 11 handily on 11th gen Intel CPUs, Brave moving to Brave Search as the default, and KD Connect for iOS seeing its first usable release. Let's get into it right after I tell you how you can extend the lifetime of CentOS thanks to today's sponsor. Thanks to Taxcare for sponsoring this video. As you might know, CentOS 8 will go end of life this December. This means that your servers won't get any security patches anymore and will basically leave your work environment and all your data in a potentially vulnerable state. Now, you could migrate to a CentOS compatible distro in a hurry, but there's another solution if you need more time. You can extend CentOS's life by four more years, thanks to Tuxcare extended lifecycle support for CentOS 8. This basically means that all your CentOS 8 devices will still get security patches for all recently discovered vulnerabilities, so you can plan your transition and migration with a little bit more peace of mind. Now, Tuxcare has a calculator online to let you figure out the cost of running CentOS without support, or you can click the link in the description below and see how Tuxcare can get you a little bit more time to plan your migration securely. Okay, let's begin with the Linux news. And KDE has announced that they have finished work on two major features. The main one being support for running the NVIDIA proprietary driver on Wayland using the GBM backend. Previously, NVIDIA only supported EGL streams, their own implementation of a graphics stack for Wayland. But they have since added support for GBM, the implementation used by other manufacturers, and now KDE will support it so NVIDIA users will be able to enjoy Wayland as well. The second main feature is support for fingerprint authentication on the lock screen, when a password is required, or even in the terminal while using sudo. On the same topic, the NVIDIA stable drivers that support this GBM backend are now out. This driver, version 495.44, has been released, and it should allow for a complete Wayland experience on GNOME and on KDE when the support is out officially, probably in Plasma 5.24. These drivers require a minimum kernel version of 3.10, which shouldn't be an issue for most users, and also implement a bunch of new Vulkan extensions and bug fixes. I didn't get these just yet in Manjaro, but it shouldn't be long now. It looks like Linux has much better performance with Intel's 11th gen CPUs as Windows does, according to some Foronix testing. They tested multiple Linux distros, including Ubuntu 20.04 and 21.10, as well as Arch Linux, Fedora 35, and Clear Linux. And they found that on the exact same hardware. Clear Linux finished in the first place for 75% of their tests. Fedora finished first 9% of the time, and Windows 11 Pro only finished first 6.8% of the time. This seems to compound with the performance issues Windows 11 seems to have with Ryzen CPUs as well. So, as often, Linux seems to be a more optimized system than Windows is. Moving on to the open source news. The MAUI project, a framework to develop cross-platform, responsive applications based on Qt, has published a new report on their progress. A lot of Plasma mobile applications use that framework. And for these users, good news are coming. They have improved the startup times by a factor of 5 on the Pine phone, and that probably applies to every single other piece of hardware. This means that all MAUI-based apps, as long as they use the latest version of the framework, should perform a lot better on low-powered devices. Most of the MAUI apps, like the Index File Manager or the Wave Audio Player, also have received sizable updates. Let's hope that we see these pushed soon to all Plasma Mobile running Pine phones and future PinePhones Pro, if that's not the case already. A long time viewers of the channel might have seen my various videos about Slash E, the open source de-Google version of Android. The system has finally been renamed after a few years of deliberation, and it is now called Morina. So the eCloud and the eSmartphones are now Morina Cloud and Morina Phones, but the operating system will remain EOS since it acquired a bit of notoriety under this name. There are no real explanations that I could find about why the Marina name was chosen, and I'm not sure I quite understand what it conveys, but it should at least be easier to look for and to pronounce 
then slash E when browsing the web or making these videos. If you follow these kind of news, you might have heard that a former US president will launch their own social network, called Truth. Whether that name is very ironic or not isn't for me to judge, but it seems that this network might be built on Mastodon, which is open source and free to reuse, as long as these forks are also following the same license, the AGPL v3. Now it seems that in this network's case, the source code isn't available, nor is a copy of the general product license, so it's generally breaching the license of the code it's using. Mastodon has since sent a formal notification to the social network to inform them that they're breaking the rules. Safari is quickly becoming the new internet explorer for the web, holding it back for everyone. As the Google monopoly expands on the desktop, on mobile, Apple Safari still holds a big share of the market, and that's a problem for developers. Safari gets very few updates, and its WebKit engine is crippled by the lack of support Apple enforces for modern APIs, in all likelihood to protect their App Store business against progressive web apps that could get too close to native applications for comfort. The issue is that developers either have to maintain fixes specifically for Safari, for bugs or behaviors that will never be fixed, or they can abandon Safari support and leave a bunch of users stranded on iOS devices with broken websites. As someone who has worked on websites for the past 10 years, I can confirm this assessment. If Apple keeps holding the web back on mobile, they will quickly lose all relevance for web developers and iOS users will find themselves slowly pushed out of the mobile web. Now onto some gaming news, VKD3D Proton version 2.5 has been released. This library allows to translate DirectX 12 calls into Vulkan calls for Linux, and this new release now improves DirectX ray tracing. With this new release, support for this API is now more or less feature complete, according to the developer. Version 1.1 of DirectX ray tracing is now experimentally available as well, by simply adding a launch option to the game in Steam. This should allow games like Control, Deathloop, World of Warcraft, and Resident Evil Village to have full support for ray tracing. NVIDIA's DLSS should also work on more DirectX 12 games, thanks to an NVIDIA contribution. Lots of bug fixes also went into Diablo 2 Resurrected, Far Cry 6, Deathloop, Hitman 3, or Dirt 5. Steam has announced Deck Verified, a way to know if a game will run on the Steam Deck or not. This system will be visible on the Steam Deck itself, in your library and in the store, so you can identify which games run well and which games don't run. There are currently four levels planned. A verified game will have been tested to be fully compatible with the deck, a playable game will run but might have some issues, an unsupported game won't run at all, and unknown games just haven't been tested just yet. This label doesn't just include compatibility with Proton, but also checks for launchers, compatibility with controllers, or support for the DEX resolution. That's a fantastic idea, and I wish Valve worked on this system for general Linux gaming as well. Now, if you've always wanted to play PS3 games but didn't want to buy a console to do so, the future might look brighter. RPCS3, the PS3 emulator, has announced that all PS3 games are now at least bootable on their emulator. Now, this doesn't mean that all of them will run correctly or at all, but at least they can now focus on making sure that all these games that at least boot up can reach the main menu and be playable after that. They have also improved graphics over the last year, so games that run should also look a lot better than they once did. It's still not a complete solution for all games, but it's getting a lot closer. Wine 6.20 was released. As always, it adds a bunch of new modules converted to the PE executable format, like MSXML or Xaudio, and the HID joystick backend is now the only one that is officially supported in direct input, as work has been completed on it. Wine 6.20 also fixes 29 issues, including for Path of Exile, Diablo 2 Resurrected, or Rise of the Tomb Raider. Now, in terms of hardware news, we only have one item. Star Labs, a Linux laptop manufacturer, announced their Starlight Mark IV. It's a small 11-inch laptop which is running with a low-power CPU, the Intel Pentium Silver N5030. While this might not be enough for a lot of use cases, a lot of people also don't need ultra-powerful, power-hungry multi-core CPUs and just need a device for web browsing and writing a few things down. 
The chassis is custom designed by Star Labs, it's made of aluminium and it has a glass trackpad, so it's not just a cheap Chromebook either. It comes with Core Boot, it's rated for 8 hours of battery life, it uses fast SSDs and charges with USB-C. It only has an 8GB of RAM option, which should also be plenty for this laptop's use case. And it starts at 479 euros, which is pretty reasonable. Now onto the privacy news. Brave has officially removed Google Search as the default search engine, replacing it with Brave Search instead. The search engine has already served 80 million queries per month and is built on an independent index that only calls to Google if the search results really don't return anything. It also doesn't track clicks or searches in tradition with the privacy focus of Brave as a browser itself. This default setting will only be deployed in the US, Canada and the UK, as well as in France and Germany where it will replace Quant and DuckDuckGo respectively. Of course the setting won't override a user's preferred setting and you will still be able to set whatever engine you want. Interesting to note as well, the service is for now ad-free, but an ad-supported version will come in the near future. I have a video on Brave and Brave Search on the channel, check it out in the card up top to see how it holds up. Looks like the US's internet service providers are as shady as everyone thought they were, and they collect and sell enormous amounts of personal data, as a government study has concluded. The FTC has explored their practices and found that these broadband ISPs collect all the location, browsing and behavioral data they can and then share these with middlemen through weird corporate montages that aren't disclosed. Opt-out options provided to consumers are apparently illusory and don't do anything. It's pretty horrifying as the ISP know virtually every single request their users have made on the internet, so their access to data is even larger than what Google or Facebook could collect. This kind of tracking can't even be blocked at all. I'm certain it's not an issue that's limited to the US, but the lack of real privacy laws there is probably to blame. ProtonMail won a ruling in a Swiss court that means that they are not considered a telecommunications operator, and as such they don't have to collect and give data to the Swiss government. It's unfortunate that it happens a bit too late to avoid the controversy Proton got involved with a few months back, but it's still a pretty interesting victory, as it means that the company has now one less legal obligation to gather and transfer data to a government. The company's CEO still expects governments to try and pass more laws in the future to try and force companies to collect and transfer data about their users. And let's complete this video with some application-related news. A new version of FreeOffice was released. It's a free-of-charge office suite that is not open source, but is available for Linux as well as macOS and Windows. The new release is supposedly seamlessly compatible with Microsoft Office file formats, both new and old, and it still contains three applications for word processing, spreadsheets and presentations. It supports a Ribbon UI as well as a more old-school menu system, and I have heard good things about its compatibility and stability, even though I didn't use it myself to any big extent in a few years. If you want to try it out for yourself, it has RPM, DEB and Archive formats on their website. KDE Connect for iOS is now available for testing, provided you're willing to add it through test flight as it's not yet available in the App Store. This first version isn't complete as it doesn't support notifications pass-through between your phone and your computer, but it is still a very nice first draft. It didn't work for me and for a lot of others on Ubuntu 20.04 based distributions, but on my desktop running Manjaro, I could send pings, transfer files really easily and use my phone as a touchpad for my computer. It's pretty exciting to see that iOS users will soon be able to enjoy the same level of phone-computer integration that Android users have had for a while. Now the big news, Photoshop has a web version. It's still pretty limited, letting others view and comment on Photoshop or Illustrator files without the need for a Creative Cloud subscription. Subscribers to Adobe Suite will be able to make light edits to their files directly on the browser. It is still not a fully-fledged replacement for the complete programs, but it is a first step that might end up with the complete suite in a browser, making it accessible to virtually any operating system, including Linux. This could be, in the future, a major asset for us, as the Adobe Suite is often cited as one of the main problems making it hard for people to move over from Windows or macOS. 
And finally, Microsoft Edge is now officially available for Linux in stable form. The Chromium-based browser from Microsoft was already working on Linux, but as a beta. Microsoft's repositories only seem to include DEB and RPM packages for now, but I have no doubt that other distros will package their own versions quickly. Edge isn't a browser I have used before, but I have heard good things, and it seems to benchmark somewhat higher than other Chromium-based browsers. So maybe it will be a suitable candidate for my quest to find an alternative to Firefox on Linux. Stay tuned for the results of that hunt later this month on the channel. And this concludes it for this video, guys. It was made possible by Slimbook. If you don't know about them yet, they're a Linux manufacturer based in Valencia, Spain. They make Linux desktops, laptops. They ship worldwide. They have all keyboard layouts. I basically only use their desktop and laptop these days. So if you want a new Linux-based device, check out the link in the description below. So thank you guys for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, don't hesitate to like and subscribe. And if you didn't, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments. You can also join my Patreon subscribers and YouTube members, and you'll get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!